Hello, in this video we are looking at siblings, relationships with your siblings when you're the family scapegoat. And my name is Mary Toulon, I'm a scapegoat child recovery specialist and all my content does come with a trigger warning so please be mindful of that as you listen to this video. Uh, some of the things may be upsetting and triggering if they're ringing true for you. So what we're covering today is coping with the sibling, sibling dynamics. We're going to be understanding the setup, why it's so confusing, why sometimes they're nice, will they change, what happens when the parents die and how to deal with all of this. So when you're the family scapegoat, um, first of all, it's uh, um, important to understand the severity of the abuse. If you're the family scapegoat, you're being ostracized by the parents and of course the siblings as well. Everybody is in on the act. Um, the scapegoat must be ostracized from the family unit and that means not having any allies. So it is important for us um, when we're coming into our recovery not to minimise the severity of that because if we are minimising the severity of the abuse then we're in a place where we think we should be able to speak to siblings and have siblings in our life and we're not understanding that that's not possible because we're the family scapegoat. The family scapegoat must be ostracized, rejected. The family scapegoat is bad. The family scapegoat is the cause of all the problems in the family. They must be viewed with contempt, treated with hatred, ostracized because they're so bad. Uh, so the family unit suffers insanity, suffers from delusions, we're the family scapegoat, we have not done anything wrong, uh, we were a child, we were not out to hurt the parents or anything like that. So just if you are in contact with siblings and dealing with the confusion, like I don't understand, I haven't done anything wrong, I'm nice to my siblings, I want to get on well with them, I bend over backwards to make sure that I'm in their lives and maybe your siblings have children and you enjoy being an aunt or uncle to your nephews and nieces. So there's a lot uh, to it and there's a lot at stake as well. So yeah, un that's understanding the setup is that it's a very, very toxic set up and we've been subjected to decades of abuse. So the siblings are trained and programmed by the parents to do the dirty work of the parents. The parents need to reject this child. As a young child, we were a liability uh, in the family unit because the scapegoat is a truth teller and a truth seeker and we're honest and we call it as it is and we named the elephant in the room. We were an innocent child, we didn't understand what the problem was with that but as an adult we can understand that it was a big problem because all the dysfunction in a dysfunctional family unit needs to be kept under wraps. They need the status quo. They don't want to change, they're happy as they are. So if you're struggling with trying to understand uh, relationships with siblings, um, it might help to step into their shoes for a minute. Um, in some families, the scapegoat is always the scapegoat from day dot. In other families, the roles can fluctuate slightly. If you were like me and you were the scapegoat all the time, uh, if you think about your siblings, your siblings witnessed from a very young age all through their childhood, your parents bullying you, your parents hurting you 
and they were just standing there observing this, taking it all in. That's very terrifying for a child to witness their parents hurting their sibling, to be powerless with that. Um, if we think about loyalty and allegiance for a child, who are they going to be loyal and pledge their allegiance to? Is it going to be their five-year-old sibling or is it going to be their 40-year-old parent who is putting food on the table and is helping them survive? Without those parents, that child wouldn't be able to survive. So just to be aware of the deeper ramifications that our siblings are in a, their nervous system is in a life and death situation with that, as ours has been as well. Um, the abuse that takes place in a dysfunctional family is severe um, and it's very, has a lot of impact on us, as you know. Um, so why it can be so confusing is that we're just uh, still have layers of denial around that, which is very valid. Um, I certainly did for many, many decades of my life. My system was not prepared to see the full truth of the situation. I was very much trauma bonded with the family system. Um, so, so yeah, sometimes the siblings are nice and then sometimes they're not. Sometimes we feel we have an ally in the siblings and we cling to that for dear life. Um, and then other times they turn their back on us and they pull the rug. This is very, very common in dysfunctional families. It's about smoke and mirrors. It's about disorientating the victim keeping the victim bamboozled so they don't know which way is up. I'm sure you're very aware of the term gaslighting. There's a lot of gaslighting for the family scapegoat. There's a lot of manipulation. There's a lot of lying and there's a lot of gossiping behind the scenes. The difficulty when the siblings are nice is that it doesn't last very long and they pull the rug from under our feet sooner or later. So if we are in that situation, if we have that situation in our life at the moment, to put it bluntly, we're in an abusive relationship. We know that we can't assert our basic human rights. We know we can't name it because then we're subjected to reactive abuse. The sibling gets very angry. The sibling immediately turns the tables and turns us into the perpetrator. And we walk on thin ice with these relationships. It's an abusive relationship. So it's difficult for our psychology to get around this. Perhaps sometimes we can really have come to terms with the fact that the parents have been very abusive and there's kind of no hope to have a healthy relationship with them. And then sometimes our subconscious will just shift that over then to the siblings. And it's like the inner child can say, okay, well, I know mom and dad are out of the picture, but I'm going to have a sense of belonging and connection and a sense of family with my siblings. And this is just a continuation of the fantasy that we had to build up in our mind from childhood to protect our psychology. But now that we're adults, we might just be able to let go of some of those layers of denial. It's very, very painful for us when we're in denial because we're in an abusive relationship and we're being on the receiving end of that bullying and that toxic behavior and that cruelty from the siblings who feel very entitled to treat us in that way. 
And then the alternative can be very painful for us as well, that we know if we try to assert our boundaries and our basic human rights, they're not going to be respected. So where does that leave us? Kind of leaves us out in the cold. They're just going to say, well, bye bye then, uh, or good riddance, or it's all your fault. You, you're the one that's walked away on your family. Um, so that's painful as well. So one of the things that might keep us hooked in is that we're trauma bonded with family members. We can be trauma bonded with siblings. That like this is our only family member. This is, we thought this person was an ally. They are nice to me. They're not a bad person. And we're just telling ourselves a story. We're creating a fantasy so we can have some sense of belonging for a human being. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, belonging is a really deep core need. And perhaps your parents are deceased as well. Perhaps you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s or beyond. Uh, and just to have that family member, that person that knows you, you grew up with, you've got so much in common, uh, same DNA. Um, the prospect of not having them in your life can be very, very difficult. And what I can say about that is the difficulty lies with the inner child. Um, it, that's to do with the trauma bonding. So the inner child, which is the younger part of our psychology, can feel I won't survive not having any family in my life and then that puts us in a precarious situation because we know these people are abusive we know they're hurting us we know we're coming away uh, feeling devastated and it's impacting our mental health negatively it's impacting our physical health negatively and our emotional well-being but we can't seem to get clarity with that situation and we don't know what the solution is. And perhaps we're trying and trying to fix the situation and it's just a parallel of what we were trying to do with our parents. We were trying to get them to accept us. We were trying to get them to stop hurting us and stop bullying us and we thought the solution was for us to come up with. Where we can see now that if a parent is hurting their child, that's a problem for the parent. The parent is very, very unwell and it's not safe for that parent to be around children because they're inflicting harm and they're not going to stop inflicting harm. So we can definitely have a lot of fear and terror in our system at the prospect of standing up to the bully siblings or there's a few bully siblings um, because we know that um, standing up to them, there's going to be severe consequences. It's going to rock the boat, the sleeping volcano is going to erupt. So it feels safer to just take the abuse on the chin, what is very, very familiar to us for decades and decades, and the uncertainty of, well, what would things look like if I actually had the strength and courage to stand up for myself? And I'm not saying that you're not strong or you're not courageous if you are in that situation, because I know how difficult it is. Um, and what we can do is build up to it. We can build the mental strength and mental capacity to withstand the uncertainty of what would happen if we asked for boundaries to be respected. That's an oxymoron. There is no boundaries in a dysfunctional family. This is part of the problem. And we will have known that. We will have many times tried to ask to be respected, ask to be treated with kindness, and they just laugh you out of it. You know, they're not going to do that. They have a certain entitlement 
within them because they've been programmed from the parents that they've been also given the green light from the parents. It's okay to treat your sibling like this. I give you brownie points if you do my dirty work for me and bully this family member. And that's to do with the insanity in the dysfunctional family system where they ostracize one family member and kick them out of the family unit. So it's just knowing and understanding that the fear is valid. Like what will happen if I stand up to my sibling? We're gonna lose them. They're, they're not gonna be in our life anymore. Perhaps you have a connection with nephews and nieces. So there's a big fallout that happens with this. And a question we can ask ourselves is what is it costing me? So we're adults now, we're not children anymore, we're not teenagers anymore, we're adults now and we get to choose how we are treated by others in a way. Uh, if others are not treating us with respect, if others are bullying us, if other people are unsafe, we do have a choice whether to stay in that situation or not. And I know there's a huge um, consequence to us for that. It means that we're going to lose our family because there's the chances of them respecting our boundaries are slim to none. Um, so that's what I mean about developing the mental capacity and thinking ahead what will happen if I am not willing to tolerate this bad behaviour from my siblings anymore. And it's to just um, be mentally preparing for that and building the capacity in your system. There's some grieving work to be done with that and letting go of the fantasy, just letting that fantasy disintegrate. Um, grieving what we thought we had grieving what we wished we had, grieving what we thought it could be in the future and letting go of the fantasy, which is very, very difficult. So a question I get quite a bit is, will the parents change? My answer to that is no. And I've worked with family scapegoats since 2019. I have worked with hundreds of people. Um, I can say that I have never had a client that had a healthy relationship with their sibling in a way that they were, for example, meeting them for coffee once a month, catching up with them and that it was uh, smooth sailing and they didn't feel any anxiety and there wasn't any undercurrent there. I haven't had any clients like that and I've been working with family scapegoats since 2019. And perhaps maybe it's not always the case, <laughs> but um, it's best to proceed on the basis that they will not change and to help you a little bit more with that understanding, you can ask yourself how long have they been behaving badly towards you? How long have they been bullying you and being cruel to you? And what would it take for them to change? Do they want to change? Gener generally, the answer is no. They don't want to change, they're happy out. Some people ask, do they know um, if they're hurting me <laughs> and I've done a video on that one and they lack yeah they just they just um, think very differently to we do one of the mistakes we can make is well if I was them I would be devastated to think that I was hurting my sibling and they were suffering really with their mental health because of all this bullying in the family system, they don't think in that way at all. So the family members that we have that 
hurt us, are very, very cruel. They lack empathy. And a person who doesn't have capacity for empathy is a dangerous and unsafe individual. So for us, it's about protecting ourselves, protecting our mental health, and maybe just ease back a little bit on taking on the full responsibility for the success of the relationship, um, just doing maybe a bit of an inventory about the siblings, how long have they been treating me like this? Do they want to change? What would it take for them to change? Do they have access to really good trauma ter therapy? And how long would that process take? And just think about how long you've been in therapy and how many decades of your life that you have been in recovery. And ask yourself what your family members are doing about their recovery and how many, how much time have they spent in recovery? So just to help you understand uh, what is at stake here and what would it really take for your dream of your sibling to turn around, what would you want them to say to you? Would it be, oh, I, I see things so clearly now. I've taken off the glasses and I can see the truth of everything and oh my goodness we've been treating you so terribly and I really want things to change and I'm really sorry about that and things will be different and I'm starting therapy tomorrow. That is a little bit of a pipe dream. So what happens when the parents die is things get worse so I would just say to bear in mind uh, and mentally prepare, it's best to err on the side of caution that things get worse when the parents and the main perpetrators are out of the picture. We're talking about intergenerational trauma, so it just flows down to the next generation with great accuracy. Uh, sometimes I get the question, what do we do when we have nephews and nieces and we see that they are being subjected to the intergenerational trauma? This is a very tricky one. Um, we can just heal ourselves. We're just responsible for ourselves. And if we focus on our healing, we can be a role model for our nephews and nieces. They mightn't understand it now, they might be too young, but hopefully further down the line, they will see. And of course, if they ever reach out to you at that point, um, you would be able to communicate with them when they're an adult. Um, there's not much we can do in that regard, um, unless you want to contact child protection services or something which is outside the scope of what I can assist you with. Um, so yeah, it's just about putting on our own oxygen mask first. And yeah, so how for us, how to deal with it is I want to impart the message to you today to really protect yourself ask yourself, what am I tolerating with my relationship with my siblings? What am I no longer willing to tolerate? What is it costing me? What is it costing my mental health? What is it costing my physical health and my emotional well-being? Um, and just allow another layer or two of the denial to disintegrate. Um, knowledge is power. So it's painful when we're being abused by them. It's also painful to know the truth. Um, but at least with knowing the truth, we can move forward with it. If we're being abused by them and not allowing ourselves understand the full scope of the truth, 
we're stuck in a bit of a loop with that. So either way, it's painful. It's painful to know the truth. So we may as well start moving out into the truth. And of course, we do need support with that. We need help uh, and we need resources with that. And hopefully my videos provide a little bit of help in that regard. Wising up to how they're abusing you and the toxic behavior, understanding that if you really have the confusion around that, it's understanding that there could very well be a trauma bond there. So that's with the inner child is trauma bonded uh, with the dynamics. The dynamics are very, very complicated and the inner child or our nervous system is in a life and death situation. That's the reason it's so difficult to extract ourselves from the trauma because our nervous system is viewing it, is feeling it as a life and death situation. Our nervous system is saying, I will die if I don't have this relationship in my life. I won't be able to survive without any family. I won't be able to survive when I'm all alone with no family members. What I can say to you about that, if that resonates for you, that's the inner child. That's the voice of the inner child. It was very true when you were age five, you couldn't survive without your family members. Is it true now? Hopefully it's not. Hopefully you live away from them. Hopefully you have some financial independence and your own life and some independence with all of that. Um, and I can say from personal experience that it's possible to survive without them. I went no contact in 2018 from my parents, from my two siblings, from extended family, from some friends as well. And I am here today to tell the story. I'm very happy. Um, granted, I have done Trojan healing work. Um, but it is humanly possible to survive without family of origin, even though they are walking the planet as we are. It is very, very possible to have a happy life. I can say I'm very happy. So just to give you a little piece of hope there, healing is possible. And you may have been brainwashed to believe that you won't survive without us. That's a big one for dysfunctional families, for the scapegoat child. Um, they try to uh, brainwash you with that belief to keep you hooked in. And so they have a trash can to continue to bully and try to destroy for their entertainment. Um, but it's, uh, it's not true that you, you can survive without them. And the psychology can survive. The uh, humans were very resilient, especially the family scapegoat, were very, very resilient and our psychology can survive. Yes, there is some grieving work to do. Yes, there is a lot of letting go to do, almost letting go of an identity of who we thought we were. Um, but it is doable, it is possible, uh, and I wish you that empowerment as well. So let me see what else I have to say about this. Yeah, setting boundaries. I think I mentioned that, that there are no boundaries in a dysfunctional family. The scapegoat will not be afforded boundaries. So that's out of the question. Uh, you probably know that already. Some people do ask like, how can I, set boundaries, how can I stick to my boundaries with my siblings? The answer to that is uh, you, can, you can put in boundaries such as like, um, like don't, well, you can put in boundaries when you're going no contact or low contact. And you can say like, please don't phone me, please don't um, visit me. And then if they break that, you can you can just block them or you don't have to answer your front door if they ring the doorbell. 
Um, so you can just adhere to your boundaries that you set. If it's a case that you're saying, like, please don't say those cruel things to me, please don't lie about me, they're not going to respect those boundaries because there are no boundaries in a dysfunctional family. That is about all I have to say there um, on siblings. I hope it's given you some food for thought. Um, the main thing for us as the family scapegoat is to wise up to what's happening. Um, they are pulling the wool over our eyes because they want us hooked in. They, we, the scapegoat does serve a very big benefit in the family unit and it's just knowing what would happen if we asserted ourselves and stood up for our basic human rights. It's just under playing that scenario out in your head and your choice then as to how to proceed with that. But knowledge is power, so that's why I wanted to share that with you today. Thanks very much for watching and if you did want any further help with this for recovery for scapegoat child abuse i do run a monthly membership and you're very very welcome to join that i support people from all around the world to heal from the role of the family scapegoat and you'll get the link to that in the description below thank you